Hey, this is Fred Jackson of the Seattle Seahawks, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Happy Pro Bowl, everybody. Woo! Who watched it? Were you Team Irvin or were you Team Rice? Who won? Because <laughs> uh, that's the team I'm on. I don't remember <laughs> because I didn't watch much of that game. I, I didn't watch it. What? You didn't spend hard analysis time watching the Pro Bowl? I was going for Team Edward. Or was yeah. it uh, wait, Team that, Jacob? That I think that, yeah, oh, that wait a, a second. Reference? Yeah, I, I don't know. The, the Pro Bowl is the Pro Bowl. It is what it is. And we're not talking about it anymore. There you go. Welcome Done. to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. We've got a great show for you today. We've got our rookie rundown. I don't even know if that is a good title for it because we're going to look at the rookies at the quarterbacks and the wide receiver positions today. And we're going to break down their numbers. We're going to project them forward. We're going to drop you some pretty interesting stats about those guys and we're going to tell you whether we think they'll be better or worse next year and where they should fall in your kind of your fantasy, uh, your draft preparation. We're also going to talk a little bit briefly at the beginning of the show about uh, some troubling performances for players last year. If you want to get a hold of the show, it's very easy. A bunch of different places you can check us out on Twitter at the FF Ballers. You can do it on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. We've also got our fantasy community at jointhefoot.com. And you can check us out on YouTube as well. So, Yes, no Pro Bowl-related questions to start the show, but our quick question is this. What player's performance troubled you the very most last season? I'm going first. You take it. <laughs> and I'm going first with Andrew Luck. First the worst is what I've heard. And this is not me saying Andrew Luck can't bounce back. But I, I'm also not a fan of blaming every single thing that I see on the field for the course of half a season on injuries. And I feel like that's what's taking place with Andrew Luck is we say, okay, he was hurt or banged up. And so when he played in seven games and he threw 12 interceptions and he had a, a completion percentage that dropped six and a half percent to 55%, um, I, I should be a little concerned. I should be a little troubled about the fact he did not come out and justify by any possible way his 20 overall position. Ooh, which not, is what he was last year in ADP. Oh, number 20. He was 20 Just, overall last year because ugh. everybody said he's this guarantee at the quarterback position. We didn't. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying this is where <laughs> this is where he was drafted. That wasn't a 2-2. Two, two. No, no, no. We like That's Andrew fair. Luck. We all like him in the in the whole framework of where we would draft a quarterback. I saw him save a puppy once. Yeah, I he's like a nice, nice guy. He's got a, a nice neck beard. <laughs> But listen, he had two games without an interception. That's it. He had a very, he had his lowest quarterback rating. He had his lowest uh, QBR, and it wasn't. I I actually have a stat for you on Andrew Luck that blew me away when I was looking this up. Uh, my guy who uh, whose performance was very disappointing was Ryan Tannehill. Uh, we we had hoped that his progression would go, and one of the things that I really wanted to see with Tannehill was how bad was his yards per attempt because that's one of the most telling you know statistics on a quarterback we've always kind of complained about Alex Smith and the fact that he doesn't throw the ball downfield Alex Smith for example was the number 14th worst or, or 14th right, best right in the middle right in the middle at seven thank you, thank you Jeremy Macklin for two yards of carry right yeah Jeremy Macklin made that a lot better Ryan Tannehill was 21st 21st only threw for 7.1 yards per attempt, which at well, first quarter... I thought, I, thought point, you had a, I thought you had a stat for Andrew Luck. I do. Okay. Andrew Luck is way down below Ryan His Tannehill. yards per attempt? His yards per attempt beat. He he was better than... Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Tell me that he was better than Teddy Bridgewater. Nope. He oh, was man. better than only one <laughs> this is gonna be bad. person. Only one. And that person was Nick Foles. <laughs> <laughs> at, at six, Andrew Luck's <laughs> yards per attempt were 6.42. Oh, 
Uh, oh, does that mean I should take back everything I said and really believe it's an injury? Because that's just not justifiable. No, you, you, you <laughs> How do you throw that many interceptions with that yards per attempt? You have to remember, uh, before he lacerated his kidney like a like a beast, he sucked. Yeah, he I mean, did. He, he was not good. He was not playing good. And well, th- playing well. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Mister. The grammar Wright. police are here. They be- wee wee wee. <laughs> So for for me, my guy was Ryan Tannehill, but he does not hold much compared to. So Mike, who's your non quarterback? Well, uh, you, you know what's it. <laughs> you know what's funny is uh, that was actually the highest yards per attempt of Tannehill's career. So he did improve of that statistic, uh, even though he was a very disappointing player. My disappointment, I went with Matt Ryan. Uh, oh, this is yeah most troubling performance or most troubling. That's a yes. great one, Matt Ryan. Is it, it, what's funny about Matt Ryan? He threw for about almost 4,600 yards, 21 touchdowns, but he just regressed so much from what we had, we were hoping for from Matt Ryan. Now, uh, I don't, I don't, I've never proclaimed Matt Ryan to be an elite level quarterback, but I've always thought he was a good starting quarterback. He was getting a great new uh, off- offensive scheme with Kyle Shanahan, who's been terrific for fantasy. He's got Julio Jones. And it just it didn't it didn't show up on a consistent basis. Matt Ryan had a good game here and there, but for the most part, he was just very disappointing. I am going. He was to, consistently disappointing. Yes, and I, that's why I would be trouble with that too. Because as opposed to Luck, who was injured halfway, you got to yeah, see Matt consistent Ryan disappointment disappoint. the whole year. I I am going to hope. That Matt Ryan just simply was having a an issue with the with the playbook, uh, just never felt comfortable because at least the last you take the Carson Palmer effect when he sure. came to Arizona the first year under Arians and yeah for the first half didn't of the feel season, comfortable because I mean, the last two games he uh, posted a, a passer rating of one nineteen and one oh three, and that was against one one of those games was against Carolina you know when they we saw them take down the undefeated Panthers at the time. So perhaps there is a light at the end of the tunnel for Matt Ryan, but he is going to tumble way, way down draft boards where he could become a late round value. He was somebody who so often failed in the red zone. It was so hard to watch. And just never took the. Owner. They didn't take the deep shots with Julio. No, you got to do that at least at least twice a game. Just just say Julio, go, and I'm going to throw what? you the ball. We saw them just he, – he just chucked it up to him in the Carolina game. Yes. And look what happens. <laughs> Everybody's happy. It's, it's so weird. You're Rudy happy. Jones, I'm happy. Freak athlete does freak <laughs> things. So, uh, okay, so we got three quarterbacks on the list. There are plenty of other guys that we'll talk about a lot this offseason, but those are the guys that stuck out to us. Uh, you know, troubling, yeah, some troubling issues going on with those. Ryan Tannehill is somebody who – I don't know what to expect from next year. I don't either. I really don't. So maybe that's the biggest the biggest uh, takeaway here is you don't know what to expect from any of these guys. He certainly where where's Andrew Luck gonna go? Andrew Luck's he's gonna, not gonna go twenty overall. He, but he's still gonna go too high. I believe that he. Where do you think as far as forget forget what number he's drafted overall? Where is he within quarterbacks? He's in the top three. top. He'll be. I was gonna say top five, top three probably. Who would you take over him? I think or the average the, the, the people. average people will take uh, Tom Brady very high. Cam Newton. Cam, Cam Newton will be the, for it, sure. Yeah. The recency yeah, bias of quarterback right. states if you finish last and then Rodgers and, and then, and then yeah. Luck will be in the Aaron discussion. Rogers. So, so yeah, you're probably right. Top, top five. five. All right. Before we get into the weekly rewind, we'll drop some fantasy news, some NFL news on you, and then we'll get into our quarterbacks and wide receiver uh, and the guys, the rookies, the rookies at the quarterback and wide receiver position. We do want to take a minute – and read a review from the listeners on iTunes. We really appreciate your reviews. We've got a lot of really good feedback from the Foot Clan uh, over at jointhefoot.com on the show. We we always like to be asking for feedback. This is a um, this show is active and changing every every year, and so we want to know what it's you alive. Like. The it's show alive. is a, a living being. It's, yep, yeah, it has to be fed regularly. You can mail that food to. Uh, <laughs> No, but it, we, we want to be receptive to feedback, and we really appreciate your feedback. And so we want to read a review from the listeners today. Review Asaurus Rex. This one comes in from Kid Beyond. Kid Beyond says, 
I started listening to Mike, Andy, and Jason just before the season started, thanks to the fantasy footballers and their mighty foot clan. I finished first place in one league and third in my second league. Beyond that, in the past few years of playing fantasy football, I've always been left hanging and unsatisfied at the end of the season. I crave some kind of analysis and wrap-up of the season past. How strong are my drafting skills? Did I make the right trades? How effective was I on the waiver wire? Well, the fantasy footballers completely satisfy my craving with their in-depth postseason analysis. This is a solid podcast, and I can't wait to see what the fantasy footballers bring to the table for the remainder of the offseason. Well, kid, we will go beyond your expectations. <laughs> you see what I did there? His name was Kid Beyond, and then I was like, I worked it in. Yeah, that, that was yeah. really impressive. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, what I, I liked about that review was the shout-out to the Foot Clan itself. Because this show is made up of listeners who have lots of good ideas and thoughts about uh, their teams and the players involved and decisions to be made. And so I like to shout out to the Foot Clan as well. News and notes from around the league. Oh, my goodness. Is it true? Could it be true? Are we going to be seeing the end? Oh, you got to you got to you got to play the sad music. Great yeah, that I was waiting wonderful. for the sad, sad music. No, I know, I'm picking something special out. Well, th- this is I think it's deserved. Calvin Theodore Johnson. Megatron. All right, that's not his middle name, but it sounded more dramatic. <laughs> Calvin Johnson could be retiring. He's he put notice into the team. He said it's official. I am retiring now. He has a an entire off season to think about that. Uh, how much money is he owed next year? Like eighteen. He's made. Six, he's making a lot 16? of cash. I think it's sixteen. He's, a lot so, of cash. So next year he could come back and play football and make sixteen million dollars. Now, money is not everything. Calvin Johnson <laughs> certainly has plenty of that, and maybe he's done. Maybe he's. Uh, he's broken down a lot. Maybe he's forcing a trade. No, maybe, I'm, these I'm just throwing out possible options, and or maybe it's just like you say, his, his body is starting to turn on him. He's tired of losing, uh, and I, I don't. Well, the I, Lions, I think he. I think he's coming back. The Lions still hold out hope. They said that they still want him to come back and play. The, the wounds are fresh. They hope that he will, and there is a chance. But I will say this. If I am drafting very soon in a best ball league, I am grabbing me some Golden Tate hey, oh. while his stock is low because when we saw two years ago, especially when when Calvin Johnson was out of the lineup, Golden Tate was a monster. So looking forward, maybe I do not his think he will higher. be back. I am I'm in disagreement I agree. with Mike. I think I think we've already had that conversation. This was a rumor that came out a month ago, and then now we have more cemented confirmation on that from the family and the team side it's not done deal by any stretch and that's a lot of money we saw <laughs> rumors about Marshawn Lynch they didn't get go this far last year but 12 million dollars talks you back into playing so all right what else do we got going on if he were to go ESPN Lions reporter Michael Rothstein says maybe Marvin Jones would be heading Detroit's way that's that's interesting Marvin Jones is a a nice complimentary wide receiver and I think Golden Tate is good enough to be a one. I think he showed that the uh, la- not this last year. So two years ago, when Calvin Johnson missed all that time, where Golden Tate was the man, get him a good complimentary piece like Marvin Jones, and you can still have success. All right, the Jets could have interest in tight end Scott Chandler. That was reported. This is uh, an offense that did not use the tight end very much. What's interesting though is it would be a, a he's be reunited with Chan Gailey and Scott Chandler. Was a touchdown. He was okay. He was a touchdown guy up in Buffalo with Chan Gailey. So, uh, why is this viable? I mean, well, Scott Chandler maybe gets a boost. Could be a a drain on Brandon Marshall or Eric Decker if you have another touchdown yeah, capable I, guy. I see this news and I go, "Don't do it! <laughs> don't do it. I love Brandon Marshall." I see Marshall this news and, and I I don't think a lot's mostly change. irrelevant. I mean, I agree. I don't think Scott Chandler's skill set's much different than what Cumberland. But he so, he's shown he can catch touchdowns. He did it for the Patriots too. Yeah, he's, by did it for the Patriots. When you line him up on the one, you, okay, you, okay. he's capable of doing it. Not every tight end can do that. No, that's why it's news. So, all right, impending free agent Chris Ivory 
said the Jets might not have the cap space to re-sign him. Hey, very interesting. Chris Ivory, uh, let's say he walks. What do the Jets do? Are they drafting for the position to complement, you know, with Bilal Powell? Are they re- are they really relying on a Ridley Powell type of backfield? <laughs> Maybe that's, that's not a not a super reliable group. But I, I do think if if that ends up happening, Powell looks great. They'll probably address it through the draft. If if cap is the issue, Alfred Morris maybe yeah. lands in New York. Yeah, he's a grinder. It's a swip swap. Yeah, very very similar. I think the free agent market is going to be much better this year for running backs than last year. Last year there was a lot of oh where is everybody going to go and there wasn't much interest for all of the free agent running backs and the reason was because the running back draft class was enormous. We heard about it for two years prior to last year's draft that the depth at running back this past year was supposed to be great. And what I keep hearing from the people that I actually trust this year is that there's just no running backs in this year's draft class. There's there's not a lot of depth, not a ton where you can go into the draft no matter what draft pick you're at and go, we can get a guy Can't that get we like. Carlos Williams in the fifth round or whatever it was. Oh, the list goes on, right? You had so many guys, even undrafted guys. Thomas contribute, Rawls. Contributed. Yeah, Thomas Rawls. All right, the Chiefs have signed Zeus. He to got that money. $46 million extension. Kelsey had a good game in the Pro Bowl from what I've read from people who watched I think, it. I think it's a good time to be Travis Kelsey right now. I mean, he had a he had this Pro Bowl game. He got oh, yeah. this brand new contract. He also has a new reality show of basically The Bachelor starring Travis Kelsey. Which did he negotiate uh, first? Do you think he was negotiating I, I the, think the as, Bachelor deal? As soon as The Bachelor deal got signed, the Chiefs said, oh, we got to sign him now. He's going to be big. He's going to be a big deal. He's going to command some money once his uh so he reality is, tv star fame hits he is the second highest paid tight end i those stats are are always laughable to me sometimes because of I mean, the recency because it, every year Char- yeah. I mean, charles clay last year was the same situation you can't pay i mean you're not gonna pay him more than the best but i, I wouldn't Wait, do you know who's paid the most um I would wait hold on Gronk, a second but no, i no, assume no, now it is not no, it's not. Uh, it's not grown. The most guaranteed money is – where is that? Oh, my goodness. It's recent. Go ahead. He destroyed his knee. Jimmy? Jimmy Graham. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and sense. then that's the thing, too. Is it the contract? Is it the guaranteed I know, I know. money? The, the the newest contract is always makes them the most paid, but it's just – it's still interesting. Yeah, well, before we get to the rookies and look at the quarterbacks and the wide receivers this year, we want to take a second think – our sponsor for today's show, Harry's. Harry's is the best place to get shaving. And you know what I was thinking about this week as I got another Harry's package in the mail? My favorite thing about Harry's, I, look, they've got great razors, the best razors, and the best prices for razors. Those are the reason that if you shave, you need to go to harrys.com and order through their easy online ordering system. But there is just something great about getting a package in the mail. And when you open up, I just love it. I get the extra key. I get to go to my mailbox, like open Christmas. that extra box. And then, yeah, I get to unpack. And the packaging on Harry's very nice. Well done. You can actually get for $15 their starting their starter razor kit, which comes with uh, extra blades, a handle, face wash, the whole deal to get you started. And Harry's doesn't like to discount because their prices are already really, really low. But we worked out a special offer for all of our listeners Harry's will give you $5 off your first order with the promo code FOOTBALLERS. So stop overpaying for a great shave. Go to harrys.com right now. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Enter code FOOTBALLERS at checkout and start shaving better today. Hey, rookie. Welcome to the NFL. All right, it's time for the rookie rundown. We're going to look at that very long list of incredible rookie quarterbacks. And we're projecting them forward, and we're going to talk about wide receivers, what guys did, and what we think they'll do next year. The question, in part, at least, for for Mike and for Jason and myself is this. Better or worse? Are we expecting better things from these guys? It, sh- it should be kind of a foregone conclusion for high rookies, right? they got to be better, but we'll see. We'll yeah, see what they're... we think. Because their situations change, things change. And uh, yeah, I might have been exaggerating about the very long list of contributing rookie quarterbacks. <laughs> There's two. There's two guys total. There is Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota. 
let's give these guys some uh let's give them some credit some pretty good rookie years different things happened for each of them Winston really turned his season around and became somebody who was an ascendant talent and the better quarterback right now yeah well you know one of the differences between Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota was what happened with the offense around them what what happened with Jameis Winston as the year went on is they start they started to really open him up the the difference between those two guys when it comes to completion percentage and yards per attempt are are very very similar neither one beat the other in any dominating way the the real difference was Jameis Winston had you know threw the ball way way more he had 312 completions to 230 for Marcus Mariota so Jameis Winston finished with over 4,000 yards great I mean that is that is historically great numbers for a quarterback let me let me put this oh sorry go ahead no I, finish that. what I, all I was going to say about that is Mario only played 12 games yeah so if I was you gonna, look I at was a, just about if you actually right look down. at a per game basis Mariota averaged according to fantasy data 17.5 points per game Winston was 17.2 and so uh that again just looking at that doesn't tell the whole tale because you had a season that changed for Winston. So you look at the back half of his year, he had a much better back half of the season. He's got a lot of weapons that I really like in uh, in Tampa. But projecting these guys forward, better or worse for either guy? I, I think that next year you're going to see m very similar fantasy numbers from Jameis Winston and an improvement for Marcus Mariota. And I base that mostly, for my own opinion, on what I see as the biggest outlier of all that they did this year, which is Jameis Winston getting six rushing touchdowns. He got six extra touchdowns on, you know, he only rushed for 213 yards. It just didn't seem like he is built for that for, you know, ongoing purposes. And I don't think he's going to, I mean, six rushing touchdowns, that's got to put him in the top, what, three this year? Cousins had five. Yeah, see, th this is where I actually disagree with you, where... Uh, I think five is about six, where I'd put him. Six three, two hundred thirty pounds. I mean, Cam Newton is only fifteen pounds heavier. Uh, now Cam is a different level athlete, but I'm just saying Winston is large, and, and where you're in that range where it's you're on the two yard line, you go to pass, it breaks down. He's he can He's take quick. it in. He's quick. And uh, I for twenty two touchdowns through the air, I think that can go up. Uh, I don't expect Doug Martin. Let, let's assume Doug Martin is back. I don't expect Martin to have the – I expect him to have a worse year next year because I thought Martin had researched tremendously. I think it will go down – his production will go down as Jameis Winston's production goes up. I think Winston is a quarterback one next year. That was going to be my question. He finished 13th this year. I think he improves. I think he becomes a quarterback one. Uh, where What we don't want to overlook for Marcus Mariota, though, is a triple threat. Triple threat. And what do I mean by that? He throws touchdowns. He runs for touchdowns. And he catches touchdowns. He did. He caught one. <laughs> it's, a uh, it's good to see you focusing on that <laughs> that statistic. Well, he, he, he'll do that every year. It's interesting because if you just look at the numbers, I like a lot of what I see from Mariota more than Winston. Um, obviously, Winston had a good year. I think they're going to be very close next year. I actually think they'll both be in the QB1 range. they got to get Mariota – another another option, another pass-catching option, in my opinion. Look, he threw less interceptions. Yes, he played a few less games, but he had 19 touchdowns to win since 22. Winston he had a better quarterback rating. He um, he had a good – he had a better completion percentage. Uh, I it's, it's hard to choose between those guys Winston's, because I like Mike Evans a whole lot more than yeah. I like the weapon, you know, the weapon <laughs> is the way it feels like Delaney, Delaney Walker. Walker. Well, uh, you know, Doriel Green Beckham, who we'll also talk about today. Yes, uh, they started using him more and more as the season went on, and I think he can be uh, an an added weapon to Mariota for all intents and purposes this next year. So that that is one thing I like. Whereas Vincent Jackson, I think they're going to bring him back despite his cap number, and he seems like he's not getting any younger. I don't know why. Yeah, but he, he doesn't have to be the one anymore. So Mike, if we're breaking into the top twelve with these guys. Are you taking these two sophomores ahead of uh, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick next year? Ooh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, 
I mean, you got to contextualize draft round and everything, but let's just say I'm the last one picking a quarterback. I have my pick of all three. Oof, I might go with Winston. Okay. Other guys in that range would be like the Eli's, the Stafford's, um, Kirk, Cousins. Kirk Cousins, and then on the other side would be like Carr and Alex Smith. Yeah, I, th- I think most of those guys I would take over Winston, but he's going to be a guy that, uh, as of right now, he, he might end up on some of my teams because so I, th- I think you can get him later. None of my pitching of Mariota stats convinced either of you that you'd rather have him over Mar- uh, Winston next I, year? I need a... Because you said you'd take Winston. Jason, you seem to be on the Winston side. I, I would take Winston over Mariota because I think Winston, the offense is is going to be based around. I mean, they took Dirk Cutter and made him the the head coach because of what he was able to do with Winston. That was a big reason for it. So I would take Winston over Mariota. Now let, let's others say, might think it's a bunch of malarkey, though. <laughs> if Man, Tennessee, why didn't they get a good coach? If Tennessee goes out there and they foolishly spend high draft capital on a dominant wide receiver, that please, please spend it on your offensive line. <laughs> Please, I'll just say, I'll just say that if they do something like that, if they go Detroit Lions and just keep drafting high wide receivers, then that could sway me over to Mariota. If I know that Walker and Green Beckham have somebody else, because uh, Kendall Wright has, I love Kendall Wright. I, I just like can't him stay too. Healthy. He's, yeah, and he's, his health is just overall has been disappointing. So, but uh, between the two, I would lean to Winston. So you right lean now. Winston. You lean Winston. Um, Where do you lean? <sighs> I'm right on the fence there. I, I guess I'm with you. I'd need to be. I would need to be con- further convinced about Tennessee's offense, and I mean it at the offensive line position. He was beat up this year. Uh, they gave up a, a ton of sacks. So I'll, I'll go the Winston side for the fact that you know I don't think Dirk Cutter. Uh, he he used to be an Arizona State coach. I don't think he's the best coach in the world. I think he's a pretty good offensive coordinator. I think his offenses score a lot of points. So I'll I'll lean Winston as well. I'll make it um, unanimous. So. Yeah. All right. You guys want to talk about some rookie wide receivers? Yes, I do. <laughs> How many are we going to go <laughs> through today? Good. We're going to talk about uh, about ten of them. Sure. Oh, oof. Ten? We could do it. We'll see. We could do it. All right. So let's let's do this. Is this sorted by draft order? Is this what I have in front that, of me? That is exactly how this list we're giving you today is how they were drafted in the NFL. All right. It's time for Amari really? Cooper. Yes. Really. So Amari Cooper had 72 for over 1,000 yards, 1070, and six touchdowns. So what do we think about Amari Cooper, better or worse, moving forward? We talked about him a little bit on a a couple shows ago. What are the things we like about his situation and the player? What are things that we don't like if they exist? There are so few things I don't like about Amari Cooper. And I'm finding myself – so I I was in love with Latavius Murray for next year. Yeah, you married him. You married him. I married him. I married him. Murray. And and I'm also in love with Amari Cooper, so I think I might be becoming an oh, Oakland Raiders fan here. Uh, Isn't but, tomorrow Groundhog's Day? <laughs> is that is that true? It's just the Murray thing reminded me of it. Oh, I got gotcha, you. So gotcha. with Amari Cooper, you have a or guy. Today, today is. If we're talking, <laughs> it, if we are talking about better or worse next year, <laughs> there's about a dozen reasons why he should be better. One, he's not going to be a rookie, right? So he's going to be more in the system, all of that. You look at how his numbers came about and how he was hobbled at the end of the year. He wore down. They shouldn't have even had him on the field. I remember watching him not be able to run a route. And yeah, your exact comment was something like, he's not even out there. It yeah. was something to that extent. And it was, it was just gross watching him try to play through that. But his numbers were affected by that. And I hope, I hope next draft season that his value isn't as high as it should be because of his total numbers. Probably won't be. People Maybe. will catch up. And to... Uh, to jump in with what you were saying, in the second half of the season, you could pick out four games, four complete games where he had 34 total yards in those four games. A <laughs> Wait, game, exactly 34? Yeah, a game of 20, <laughs> a game of 10, a game of zero, and a game of four. Yeah, he's saying combined. Oh, oh okay. You mean in those four games he's hit 34 yards? Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I thought you meant like he hit 34 in each one or something. Oh, no, no. I mean, he He's had 30. He's consistently terrible. Like, you add up the total of four games, he had 34 well, yards. You remember Austin Severian Jenkins came out yes, and he had three, three for straight, 31. Three for 31 games. I thought we had something going on. So, to me, that. I he, need one more yard. You, did, <laughs> you give Amari Cooper just his average production in those four games, 
and he, he's just a, he's a monster. Well, and and here's what I love about Amari Cooper, and a big reason why he was drafted first. His yards after contact were humongous. He led the entire league as far as rookies and yards after contact. And to give you an idea of where he finished, he finished as kind of that wide receiver two best, the 25th ranked yards after contact, tied exactly with Brandon Marshall, who's very, very good at yards after contact. So as a rookie to do that, I really like his ability to make his own, you know, game flow. It doesn't matter whether he's getting a screen or a deep pass. He can bust something off. Well, and, and let me let me do this for you guys. We like Derek Carr. We like the trajectory of Oakland, right? This is where they finished last year. What do you think they finished in points per game? Probably like 20th? 17th. 17th in the league. They Pass will, yards, we, 16th. Okay? This, this was overall yards per game, 24th. Yeah. The whole team, not just Amari Cooper, really fell apart in the second half of the season. Room to improve. But that's what we like to see. Some margin, rookie, ascendant. I think we all really like Amari Cooper. I, I know I do. So we say better for Amari Cooper. Do you want to throw a comparison out there? Is there a, is there a wide receiver from this past year? Ooh. Do you think that he'll be in that department? Because I see somebody like, uh, even though they're not by any means, I'm not comparing the players themselves, but the stat line of a guy like Brandon Cook seems well within the, the realm of possibility for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he can easily somebody be with, Brandon uh, Cooks. You know, nine touchdowns, 1,100 yards. That sounds right about where he's finished, which would, which would put him as like a low end wide receiver one, and exactly. I think you're going to be able to draft him better than probably that. outside of the outside of the one range. Okay, so so good point. This year, Crabtree was better fantasy wise, <laughs> right on, on the year. So you Next expect year, that Amari, to change, right? Absolutely, Amari Cooper will be the number one fantasy. They were, it was from marginal, over. yeah. Yep. Now the next guy who was drafted by the NFL, I'm gonna, I'm going to declare he will do better. He will absolutely do better next year than he did this year, and that is Kevin that's, White. That's a hot take. Hot take. Kevin White. Between him and Perryman, we get two brand new rookies. Yeah. To that degree. So Kevin White. What do we expect? I expect him to other than be able to <laughs> play. Suiting up, tying his shoes with uh, both of these, putting guys, on the helmet. Man, there is so little to to be able to bank on. You you've got to wonder, you know, with a coach like John Fox, specifically in White's case, he seemed so frustrated and like angry that he wasn't out there. You know, he's an old school. You play through injuries, you do these things, and he, you know, I expect Alshon Jeffrey to come back and That's, resign. That was the question I was going to ask you because people are going to throw his name out there in the Calvin Johnson retirement discussions as well because he's a bona fide. When you bring somebody in, like I, to me, Marvin Jones is Golden Tate, right? Yeah. I mean, from uh, a, from when I watch them on the field, they they catch the same routes, they make plays after the catch, which they, is why if he comes into that Golden Tate role as that number two, it might be good. Golden Tate can well, okay, but they might. Well, all I'm saying is Detroit might look outwardly to get a prototypical. Neither neither of those guys is a jump ball receiver for what Calvin's done in the in the end zone. Is my point. Not that Jeffrey's going to leave. So you think Jeffrey's staying? I think Jeffrey's staying. So you're going to have Kevin White come in, have a decent fake rookie year. And I expect him, you know, if you want to talk about who's he going to be like, I, I think that what you're going to have is you're going to have him come in and be at best kind of like a Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett didn't production have a bad season. Production-wise, production. you're about. He didn't have a bad season. He had a really good rookie season for a wide receiver. But, but it wasn't like low yards or low yards, high touchdowns, or you're just saying? I, I mean about where Tyler Lockett finished. Tyler Lockett had about 50 catches. In my head, I was hearing Tyler Eifert. I apologize. Oh, <laughs> I, I, so I have my projections for White well above Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett is a uh, was 42nd in the league this year. I do not think that that is... Uh, I think Kevin White, if he plays, where he was drafted and, and his abilities are, are going to be much higher than that to me. I, I would put him, him in the um, – I'd put him about what Cooper did this past year. I would That's put about him, where I'd put him at, hmm. which is uh, right outside the top 24, right in that range, um, a good season up and down. That's where I'm looking. I'm looking at like the Reuben Randall range. Reuben Randall was 29. He had uh, uh, just under 800 yards and eight touchdowns. That's incredible, by the way. Just hearing you say Ruben. For Ruben, Ruben. Yeah, because Ruben Randall was irrelevant. Rubes. He Ruben, was not. 
but he he was, was. <laughs> he was really irrelevant. But it's so for- weird. <laughs> it's so weird because we can make these like uh, conclusions that aren't conclusions in fantasy. Where you talked up Ruben Randall all preseason, he stunk. He was a for waste so of long. space, and he wasn't. Well, the That's Giants right. were very so was which, not. <laughs> he wasn't. I mean, Ruben Randall, listen to this. Okay, perfect example. Tangent time. Ruben Randall, Travis Benjamin, back-to-back in fantasy. Randall beat Benjamin. Benjamin, he got all the headlines this year, right? Because yeah. well, he was super sexy right off the top. But, I mean, because he broke out yeah, to become the, Ruben Randall. The beginning of the year, those guys, <laughs> who, do well, those guys who do well out of the gate yes, end up with yes. much better – it's funny. It's like the opposite of recency bias. It's currency. They get early currency that right. carries on to next year. Chris Ivory is going to have a much better currency because of how strong he came out. You know, in the, Here's guys the that finished behind Randall. Benjamin Aiken, Michael Floyd Bryant. Uh, all those guys are going ahead of Ruben Randall next year. I can promise you that. Yeah. And that's why I will draft Ruben Randall. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't quit you, Ruben Randall. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> so we're going a little out of order here, but but we should probably talk about Brashad Perriman since he's the sure, other rookie. Sure, who we'll do that and come didn't, back. Didn't play. To me, I see a lot more opportunity for Perriman than White. Now, White's the more talented guy, the more skilled, but you know, Kamar Aiken is no Alshon Jeffrey, and they no, need no. Uh, they desperately need a wide receiver. I am of the mindset I do not believe that Steve Smith can come back and be anything relevant this next year. Maybe he works hard and proves me wrong. But for me, I, I don't see him as like in the equation. So that to me says Brashad Perriman will have the opportunity, which is even more important than talent, so long as you're both talented. Yeah, and we broke down the numbers at the Ravens this year compared to seasons past where they've been a team that can be at the forefront of the league offensively. And they weren't this past year. So that, there's a precedent there for Flacco being able to find a new weapon like Perryman. Um, the opportunity, like you said, is there. I don't know about the skill set. We'll see that on the field. But he was drafted high enough to where he should contribute in a real way. Aiken is very much a complimentary guy. We all know that. We've watched him play football. I like the, the potential opportunity that Perryman has going into next year. Now, we got to monitor the... Uh, the recovery of Joe Flacco. I mean, we got he tore his ACL. That's a good point. Uh, and it was a little bit later in the season. I would expect it will he'll be ready to go at the beginning of the season. But you just that's something we got to keep in mind. And but for Perriman, I'm not expecting huge things. But he is a guy that I will be gladly taking in the uh, eight nine rate uh, round area where you're like it's just the upside if he hits I think he's a, I think he's a 65 and 800 type of guy with, with like with five, five touchdowns yeah yeah, yeah and, that's, and because of the way that offense goes he's gonna be one of those up and down guys the Deshaun mm-hmm. Jackson Torrey Smith have a big blow up game and then and then yeah lose so up. and it's it's unfortunate for both of these guys they both wanted to come in and have a contribution I think Perryman probably was more of a disappointment because it always seemed like he was gonna be back until he just he never was, as opposed to White, who we all knew was out, but John Fox no, no, was just John, playing. I just talked to John Fox. Kevin Is he White, still playing this still, year? He's still probable. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's talk about Devonte Parker. Um, you know, it, it'd be easy to say he didn't play part of the year because he really didn't. He, he didn't contribute in a meaningful way, which is. It's the same thing with Nelson Aguilar, our next guy on the list. I mean, they both played and didn't play in a way. Right. So, Devontae Parker, however, impresses me personally if someone will use him. So, what do you think about him? I, I'm in agreement with you. He he was very impressive. He played about 45% of the team's snaps on the year. Now, that came more and more later in the year. We saw that he could do things with the ball, even though he was, you know, Probably about spin it on his fingers. <laughs> he he played you know less snap percentage than Nelson Aguilar did by a lot, y- right? Right. Uh, well, about forty five to fifty eight percent. Oh, okay. okay. So you know a, a good chunk, but he ended up with a lot more deep balls from Tannehill, four hundred almost five hundred yards on twenty three receptions. That's that's really good. It shows that you've got that kind of one that that wide receiver one. So you've got a whole new crew coming in to Miami, and there's so many question marks here with, to me, with Jarvis Landry, with Devontae Parker, with Ryan Tannehill. 
the potential to me is that Devontae Parker could end up becoming a wide receiver one for the team and have huge blow up potential. But we, there are so many question marks. We had a big water bet at the beginning of the year where I thought Devontae Parker would end up as their highest fantasy producer. When I when I bring out my big 3D printer and I print myself a wide receiver, I print up a guy like Devontae Parker. You, wait, wait, wait. You've been, you've been holding out on us. We got a 3D printer? <laughs> How do you think my fantasy teams end up this way? <laughs> so I, he's 6'3", 210 pounds. I mean, just build me that as a wide receiver. Throw, uh, Tannehill threw the ball up to him several times where he went and made the play. And so I, I like guys that are built that way because whether it's Demarius Thomas, right, in the past that started slower in their rookie year and kind of the talent transcends eventually, in my opinion. Well, so. and, in the, and speaking of Demarius Thomas – uh Adam Gaze uh the guy who turned Demarius Thomas into a superstar is here with Devontae Parker over the final six games of the season Parker averaged 74 yards a game I mean he he really exploded at the end the spotlights and everything people stopped paying attention to the Dolphins but Parker was over there doing work uh, they're the exact same size, by the way. I didn't realize that. Him and Thomas? Demarius Thomas, yeah. Oh, Thomas has them by about 20 pounds, but they're the same height. And the the problem for Parker last year was Rashard Matthews. Yep. Matthews was actually playing capable wide receiver, so the coaching staff went with the, the veteran as opposed to the rookie, so Parker couldn't get out there and really show what he could do. And that's not going to happen this year. No, think, it will think not. About, think about the correlation. You talk about Adam Gase when he was with – uh, Denver between Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders, right? And they really focused on those two wide receivers in that system, the big guy and then the and then the possession guy. And now you've got Devontae Parker, big guy, and Jarvis Landry, possession guy. I mean, Adam Gase coming in, so potential's there for the his system to work. You two were the Hearns Decker lovers. Why why didn't you ever jump on the Rashad Matthews? I feel like he should have just we been did in the a same little category. Bit. Yeah, I I I feel like we were actually I mean, Pretty high on him. Didn't you and Rashard Matthews and Dante Moncrief and Decker and them all go out for a meal one time or something? Yeah. 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 We, and we all split the bill. Because <laughs> that's what twos do. You should. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you didn't just bill Brandon Marshall for the, <laughs> for the evening. All right. So who are we talking about now? Let's go ahead and uh, let's discuss Aguilar. We've discussed him a little bit on the show. I believe the word you're looking for is not discussed, but disgusted. <laughs> We've disgusted Aguilar. We've disgusted our disgust. Yeah, a Andy and I disagree on this. I know Andy likes Nelson Aguilar. I do not. I love to mock his numbers. He finished just barely ahead of Kevin White and Brashad Perriman. <laughs> <laughs> Despite playing 58% of snaps on his team, which was the second highest for wide receivers, he got 23 catches on the year. So, look, Nelson Aguilar. That's really good grammar again. He got 23 catches. You're welcome. He, it's the low blow. He was. Yeah, his, it's his, like his stats left. are it's just dominating your face, and you're like, <laughs> "Yeah, you can't, you can't speak." Well, look, properly. my arguments are all pr projective of yes. Aguilar. It's West Coast system, and Doc, uh, Doug Peterson coming in, implementing a system that is conducive to Aguilar, and actually targeting the guy. So, I, I can't argue. <laughs> I can't go. Yeah, twenty three for two eighty one <laughs> and one, and some ugly. Hey, you're, and some you're cutting ugly short, drops. Two eighty three. If uh, no, thank you. I need those two <laughs> extra yards. If Sammy Biscuits is the quarterback next year, which I, I believe Sammy Biscuits will be the quarterback, if he is, he just doesn't have a good rapport with <laughs> Nelson Aguilar. You he doesn't know, have a good repertoire yeah, with Yeah, he, he doesn't trust the routes or whatever it is because he was on the field enough for the whole year to see whether or not they've got a connection. Look, look, you can you got to throw some of that out, don't you? Chip Kelly's yes, gone. a lot of it. He's a rookie who didn't get worked in. He, All right, so let's talk about okay, comparison yes, for yes, next year. Okay, let me pick somebody out since you, your comparison will be Brashad Perryman. <laughs> so, uh, so Aguilar, what did I say he'd do? I, Marvin Jones. Give me Marvin Jones' numbers okay, so for like Nelson a, Aguilar. Basically a three. Basically you, a four. Three three to four range. And then right. just has those bigger games every yeah. once in a while. Marvin lot. Jones had about 800 yards, four touchdowns, um, 65 catches. Yeah. Give me, give me, uh, give me Marvin Jones' numbers. I will take Devin Funchess' numbers. Ooh. Where he's all right. He can have a good game he's here or there. The shade. But 470 yards. Yeah. So he'll double up. He'll <laughs> double his production. So okay. your, for your projections, though, you still have Jordan Matthews as the alpha. Yeah. Okay. 
I do. We, despite the conversation where Jason didn't think I did. Um, so let's let's go to uh, a less biased source here. Uh, I don't know why we'd be. We're not biased. We just have <laughs> different opinions. Um, but Nelson Aguilar, Mike, he is. Is he more like Devin Funches to you, or is he more like Marvin Jones? He's more like a Marvin Jones to me, and I'm not. That's correct. I'm not. A, <laughs> well, I would not consider myself an Aguilar guy at this point. Uh, I I think that with Doug Peterson coming in, I think that Jordan Matthews. I I believe that they will use him, uh, kind of somewhat like Macklin. Man, is was. the football season here yet? And I want to see this. We're play almost. Out. We're almost there. Almost close. <laughs> How uh, old? Hold <laughs> fire till you see the whites of their eyes. There you go. Uh, it, but Aguilar, he'll be maybe an okay flex type of guy. I'm just, I'm not. That was what that, in uh, on it. the I, 40 range would be. And I, I'm, this is uh, full transparency here. I When we were looking through this list, you're saying, well, this was draft order. I'm like, Aguilar was drafted in the first round? Yep. Like, oh, yeah, he was. <laughs> ay, ay. See, I, that's a huge huge point in my favor well he was drafted the first round by chip kelly hey no he was projected in the first round by a lot of people he was but good he at was, usc guys he yes. was drafted well usc is uh they like to send wide receivers to the nfl and then have them stink that is absolutely <clears throat> true it's happened again and again and <laughs> again it's going <laughs> so uh then <laughs> next up i'm right in the middle of you guys apparently. uh here's a guy who this um, one's full Wild card. This one is full wild card. He he had about the same <laughs> stats as Nelson Aguilar. Philip Dorsett. <laughs> Philip Dorsett uh, coming in to the vaunted Indianapolis Colts offense with Andrew Luck, who we just uh, threw shade on earlier today, really was not used. He only played 19% of snaps on the season. He got hurt, too. We, we don't know what to make of Philip Dorsett at all. He's a speedy guy that is not needed there. Now, I I don't... <laughs> he is absolutely needed. Well, now, with Andre Johnson going, I'm saying when they drafted him, it just didn't he wasn't. seem You're like... You're saying he wasn't needed. He and wasn't. You're right. Needed. He wasn't. So, this coming year, they obviously like Dante Moncrief. Uh, I believe the Colts are going to have him in. The, the real question is what they're going to do with Andre Johnson. Do they bring Andre Johnson back? No way. You got to... You got to put him out to pasture. Cut the cord. Which is exactly why I'm afraid they're going to bring him back. <laughs> to the woodshed Cause, cause we go. Because that's the, the right thing to do is let him go? Exactly. They're they're making some mistakes there. Uh, man, they're GM, yeah, baby. The I, I think they'll let him go. The, why Dorsett is a wild card for me is Moncrief. Is Dante Moncrief was successful, especially when Andrew Luck was the quarterback. And... To me, I think Andrew Luck likes the the comfort. He has a comfortability with Moncrief, and clearly, it's there with Hilton. So, where does Dorsett fit into all of this? Not saying you can't have three re successful receivers. If you're a high volume pass offense, we've seen that before. Arizona. Michael Arizona, this, Floyd, Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown. John exactly. Brown is a great comparison to Philip Dorsett's involvement. Not this that's past ceiling. year, but the year before. That's ceiling. No, the year before. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's John Brown's I mean. rookie yep. year. Yep. yep. Sure. Yep. Dorsett could absolutely be that, which is – that's a useful fantasy guy. He just is – Flip a coin. He's not going to be a reliable weekly guy. Yeah, to me – so there's there's a lot Little of – Little known fact, when you Google John Brown's name, there's a lot of John Browns yeah. <laughs> in the world, including the abolitionist, There John are Brown. There are going to be a lot of different upside flyer type picks that you make at the end of the draft next year in the conversation will be Philip Dorsett. Sure. For my teams, he won't be the guy that I'm drafting. Because what I'm looking for... Because you're looking for Reuben Randall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for opportunity more punch, than anything. Punch me right in the Randalls. And I, I think Philip Dorsett's <laughs> highest opportunity is going to be being the third wide receiver on the team. That's his... Uh, I believe that's his ceiling. Yeah, but for guys you're taking that far in the draft, you're looking for... Uh, talent opportunity. It's not just immediate opportunity. Jason, it's, it's the potential that Dante Moncrief goes down. Dorsett comes in. He's a massively talented guy, and he could thrive. He could explode. So that's why Aguilar I like or Dorsett. Like Dorsett next year. Aguilar oh. or Dorsett. No, I don't. I don't like either of those guys. You so have to who take do you like one. more. I'm saying you have to take one. I'm not, I don't I have take, to hit the button. I'm I would one hundred percent. It would be Nelson Aguilar because right. of opportunity. What here? Here's the thing. Historically speaking, the 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 number that matters 
more than anything by a wide margin for wide receivers is targets. It's been proven year over year over year over year. Nelson Aguilar should have more targets next year than Philip Dorsett just because of opportunity on the field. All right, let's talk about some of these. Um, We're good. These uh, Devin Funchess, Ty Montgomery, Stefan Diggs. You, you glossed over Green Beckham. Tyler Lockett, Doriel Green Beckham. Who do you want to talk about first? Let, uh, I think we start with Green Beckham. Okay. Uh, Green Beckham finished with a pretty lackluster rookie type year. I mean, he was a second round guy. Uh, the physical skills. Are, six six are there. man he, he is so physical huge. stature that's what i mean physical stature is there he's a bit raw missed, i need to uh, adjust my 3d printer <laughs> uh he uh missed a missed a year of college um and so he was he was a little bit more raw coming in the what makes or the the key number for me here is snaps for Beckham. how much was he actually out there how much experience was he getting as we move into next year where he will likely become the number one target uh, as far as wide receivers goes for the Titans. But weeks one through eight, only 33% of the snaps. The second half of the year, 75%. So <clears throat> Ken Wisenhunt got gets fired and Green Beckham finally gets on the field, which is that's really not a surprise for Ken Wisenhunt to be putting his rookies in the, in the doghouse. That's kind of his M.O., uh, so Wizard Hunt sent hit the bricks, get Green Beckham on the field, get him some uh, uh, experience. A lot of really bad games. I I I think I disagree with you about the number one target thing. I don't think he's remotely close. I you would water bet that he's third or or later. As far as on wide, that team. I said wide receiver. Yeah, but so Kendall Wright will probably be the most targeted. I wide receiver. I, I didn't say target. I said number one option. So I, if you if you want to you relate said that, target. To, did I say target? You said number one target. I meant as far as he's the number one wide receiver on the team. He's the alpha wide receiver. It's gonna be. Uh, I, and I, to me, it's still right. Uh, I think it. Okay. I, I think it'll be back. I, I don't think, know. What, I think what it's gonna be close because K Kendall Wright, when healthy, uh, is a is a great option. He's, a, he's an okay option. But when it comes to red zones, which you know is gonna matter. For fantasy, Doriel Green Beckham is going to be the guy that's eating up all of the Fair. jump balls, Fair. all of the valuable plays. The fact that the second half of the season he had that opportunity, some of which came at the expense of Kendall Wright's injury, right? Like that yeah, was what allowed him to get on the field. But his, so he was the number one recruit in the nation, I believe, when he was coming out of high school. Because the guy is physically a monster. I'm going to pull up his. If I never hear that again, though. What? It would be <laughs> too soon. Yeah. Because well, when, when your greatest attribute after all of college and your first year in the NFL is that you were the the top recruit in high school, it's it, the, the time is running out. But but he actually – He's only uh, played a year. I, I would agree with that in general. If he came out and stunk it up this year, I would have been – I would have been leading the charge for saying that. I feel like he had a very good second half of the year where you go, oh, okay, so that raw, raw, raw talent that we saw – just a couple of years ago in high school. I mean, the guy's still... We skipped his, college, not living up to potential in college. He didn't and we live only caught, potential in college. We only caught 30-something balls in, in the NFL. He was good in college until he wasn't allowed to play for his off-field activities. He was okay. Right. He was okay. So my point is simply, he has the talent. Now the second half of the year, he got the opportunity. So give me the comparison. Who do you think he, he's like next year? Hmm. Let me pull up. It's probably going to be one of the more touchdown heavy type of uh receivers you know i i hope for and I'm, i would never expect him to finish as high as ted you Ginn? know uh, yeah ted ginn would be a good uh, good option possible, i was thinking right yeah i mean he's gonna be that i think number two in in receptions but probably lead the team fantasy points for his team two in receptions or three i i'm saying wide receivers so okay. not but not including delaney walker all right. Just from from the wide receivers, the second option. I He'll probably be third on the team in receptions. So Ted Ginn would be, you know, the type of guy where he doesn't get a lot of he doesn't get a lot of I'm gonna go uh, receptions, but he gets the touchdowns. I'm going with like James Jones. Eight hundred and ninety and eight. I think that's I, very doable for Green The Beckham. reality about Green Beckham is that this is the same type of divergence of thought that has always existed for him when you come into the draft. When you're six six and you're built to play the position um, the way he has been, and he's flashed those things at times, 
you're going to have people who fall on both sides and say, Hey, he's going to take the leap and be, you know, kind of live up to that size and that potential. And then you have some people that are like, well, let's just wait and see. So, well, Cause here's the, what I have a point that I've, I've been meaning to talk about on the show is the, well, I want, I want to see it first type of, of thinking. This is a, a kind of a, just an overall, how I play fantasy football. The, you can't wait and see you have to be proactive you have to make the move because by the time you see it somebody else will have already made the move so if you want to be off a guy that i don't have a problem with andy not want not being really in the green beckham camp but by making him him have this decision of well if i see it you know it will he'll be gone you will you will completely miss the yeah, boat absolutely on a player like that yeah I'm, so I mean, i'm content with that with so it, and that's what you have to be if you to uh, say, well, if I'll, I'm going to see it first, you have to know you're probably not going to have that player that because somebody else is going to make the move in a projection based uh, opportunity well, instead of instead of uh, waiting to see it happen. And it's not it's not coloring my entire picture of this, but the the offense makes a big difference to me. And you know, there were games I played Green Beckham in a game last year. Yeah, <laughs> and the problem wasn't Green Beckham. Okay, the problem was two targets to wide receivers after halftime okay we all agree they're going to put somebody in place that's better at the running back position this year uh Mariota can still run the ball and he can score in the red zone you've got Wright, you've got walker it's an opportunity thing that the offense wasn't that great plus where he falls in the target chain i don't project him being great moving forward yeah that's just that's just where i fall yeah and and the truth is all these guys it's really about projection the guys we just talked about, I would rather have DGB over because I think the potential is higher. The uh, guy that I would rather have over Doyle Green Beckham, though, who I think is uh, a little bit of a sexier pick to me, would be Devin Funchess, uh, who I believe is the next guy on the list. Devin Funchess, to me, he started to show up later on in the year. He was brought in to be the two, not not the one type of role. And uh, with injury, he was kind of forced into this weird place where he wasn't used as what they thought he was going to be, and then they didn't like him. But at the end of the year, he showed that he's good. He's on a high power offense. I think that you know he's going to find easier defense next year. And Ted Ginn Jr. I don't expect to repeat this year. What is the status, the contract status of Philly Brown, Corey Brown? Do you, I was just wondering if you knew off the top of your head. I would have to look it up because I'm just asking, like because my uh, liking of Funchess would that'll have an effect on it. If Brown is He's gone, got, he has a three-year contract. Okay, if Brown is back, I still like Funchess uh, a good bit moving into next year. But Kelvin Benjamin expected to be the one. Olson, Craig, I mean, there's just Philly I, Brown. You like Ginn. that it's a high-powered offense, but there are some serious target hogs there. So Funchess, I would take Green Beckham over Funchess. Yeah, I would as well. I don't think Funchess's opportunity is going to be there. And I don't think he's got the skill set to be. I think it could be a guy that surprises people with the seven or eight touchdowns because of he's his size big, and big involvement dude. in the red zone. But I don't think you're going to get I, – I, I would say if he caught more than 45, 50 passes next year, I'd be shocked. It, very similar, to, really, in Doriel Green Beckham. I think both are going to get touchdowns and not a ton of receptions. All right, so Tyler Lockett burst onto the scene – um, really just an incredible special teams player and somebody who you saw take uh, leaps in his wide receiver, both production and just performance on the field. Uh, really impressive, 51, 664, and 6. Uh, what's the Tyler Lockett story for next year? Because he's one of those guys where I'd, I know that Doug Baldwin had the year that Doug Baldwin had, but I don't understand why it can't be Lockett on any given day. That's the I, thing about him. Yeah, I completely agree. Um. <clears throat> I, w I would say maybe it's just a, a biasy thing, but my opinion of Lockett really started to flip. Uh, there was a play where the Seahawks were playing against uh, the Cardinals, so I was getting to watch you know a ton of Lockett, and he just torched Peterson. I mean, torched him. And Patrick Peterson, if you weren't paying attention, was having a had a great season. He really turned his his uh, play around, but Lockett just burned by him, and Peterson had no chance. And it was, and then the touchdowns start coming for Russell Wilson. The first nine games of the year, Russell Wilson threw 10 touchdowns. The final seven, 24. I mean, what happened? Because 
The attempts really weren't up. Uh, he was just being far more efficient. So it, you, this is a the Seahawks are going to be a team that you are going to have to make an early decision on if you're going to buy into next year going into the buying draft. into the transition to a Russell Wilson pass first offense. Yes, uh, it, we saw and pass in the red zone offense. Exa- yeah, yeah, and you saw Baldwin getting a ton of the uh, just just a slant right on the uh, from the two yard line. Uh, it, it will be very interesting because. We expect Lynch to be gone. Thomas Rawls coming off a fractured leg. Uh, you expect him to be the number one guy, but weird things happen in the Seahawks. Will uh, will they make that complete transition to when they're running up the score? I mean, the Seahawks have never been a uh, – not never, but the last prolific few years offense. of the Pete Carroll years, they've not been a prolific offense, putting up huge fantasy points. Russell Wilson was good – for fantasy, because he ran the ball and he was scoring a bunch of rushing touchdowns. He didn't have those rushing touchdowns this year, and he didn't need them because of the second half of the year, he went nuclear with his touchdown passes. Uh, that's the story. And, and and the question is, is it seems like that's the trajectory that the, the Seahawks are going to take with their offense. You can still kind of make the kind of logical argument that they had the least success they've had in three years by doing so. Right, because by not not, making not the being Super Bowl. A, well, and they were they were thrust into a position where they couldn't depend on the run the way they wanted to. Whether it was Lynch's injury, then Rawls' injury, then all of a sudden you're running Chris and Michael and Bryce Brown out there. And, but that really wasn't why Wilson got involved. Wilson got involved early. What from week nine, right? Yeah, yeah. after I think they had a week nine bye, and then and then they came back. So and were and and then he was on fire. Tyler Lockett. When you look at the targets between the first half of the year and the second half of the year. You can definitely see that his targets were up. He had a four-game stretch in a row, uh, four of the last five games, where he got seven targets Love every it. single game. And so those are th- that's what you want to see. He's getting more trust from Russell Wilson. I think Tyler Lockett takes a step up this next year and, and finishes better than he did this year, which was a pretty good year. So, I mean, I, w- I would rather have Tyler Lockett even still over – uh, a lot of these other guys yeah, we've been I've, talking about. I, I likely take, would, too. I'd take Lockett at his draft value over Baldwin at his draft value. I will and tell I, you that right now. And yes. I won't, but That's I, fine. I, I'm, a, I'm a Baldwin believer. Yeah, I would, I'm would. i with Andy on that one. And another note, uh, Curse, Jermaine Curse, this was a contract year. I don't expect him back with Seattle. Well, that'd be great. I, I would agree with you on that. And so that's, that's why I like Lockett. It, it's, Nor do you expect Jimmy Graham back. Uh, uh, ever uh, he'll, he'll be there in uh, his body will be there collecting checks <laughs> yeah he'll be doing that not that I blame him it's not you know <laughs> you take the risk and sometimes that happens it's not oh. like he chose that injury that's for sure <laughs> all right um, this season I'd like a patella I'd like a devastating knee injury yeah. please what's the what's the cost of that <laughs> right um, a lot to Seattle. All right, so Ty Montgomery, Stefan Diggs, guys, be brief about these these two. There yeah. are other rookies as well, the J.J. Nelsons of the world, and other other players that we're not getting into on this show. But they will not they will not lack discussion for the off season. Trust me on that. We'll be doing a early bird mock draft earlier than you think. We got to do one soon. We are. We're going. The people to. have spoken. So these player names will come up. But guys, give me give me a couple seconds on these guys, and then we'll get into the mailbag, and uh, we'll we'll hit the tight ends and the running backs on on Thursday. Uh, Ty Montgomery barely played this year, showed that he was a an, an electric weapon, but could not be healthy. Caught nearly everything thrown his way, but that was pretty much about two feet away from Aaron Rodgers. And by a couple seconds, I mean I'm gonna throw you another question. Ty Montgomery showed a lot to me on the field when he was there in limited work. Randall Cobb showed me a very little. Show me that there are some concerns there. Got paid, didn't perform to the level that I expect. Maybe Cobb comes back and he's fine. That catch was incredible at the end of the year. I don't know why we didn't see more of that Randall Cobb. But does Montgomery have a, a, a cracked door because of Cobb's performances? Nope. All right. Mike, <laughs> I don't, I don't Mike, tell me all. about Stefan Diggs. So Stefan Diggs. The, you, you looked up some interesting numbers on him. The, the, here's the question for Stefan Diggs. What happened? What happened? What happened? So great. What's going on? Because his first four games, 40 targets. And this was when he was the waiver wire beast. It was, he was on, you stay in the flames with digs and he was tearing. He was winning weeks 
Turn it up. 40 targets for the first four games. The final nine games of his season, 44 targets. What happened? Extra attention. Yeah, that's what my question was going to be. Was So it, lack of separation from yeah. extra attention. He became the one, and, and teams treated him as such. And Mike defense. Wallace was standing over there on the sidelines <laughs> going, Hey, I'm the one. I'm the one. And we're like, in his, like, mink coat. So can you, so can <laughs> you trust? Because so much on that. Mink, minky Mike. Does Diggs take a step up this next year and show? I mean, he was an, just amazing on the field at no. grabbing the balls that came to him. You say no? I say uh, no. Not what, not what I would define a step up as. I would say he obviously isn't going to just play 13 games barring injury. So his numbers will improve, but I don't think proportionally they'll be much different. I well, don't, you, I say, don't. You, say, you say no, and I say no. I agree. Yeah, it, unless there's some upgrade to the other side of the field with uh, where Wallace is, then then no. All it's right, no let's, for me. let's go ahead and get into the mailbag. Maybe. <laughs> I hate that. The thing. Hold on. Mailbag. Bang your bang. Sometimes I... I tell my soundboard to freeze in order to build anticipation. Ooh, drama. For your... We know drama. Do, do, do. Yes. Andrew in Philadelphia, he says he's thinking about his keeper selections already for next year. We all are, Andrew. Definitely keeping Le'Veon Bell and Julio Jones, but he has to pick a third between David Johnson Ooh. and Thomas Rawls. So many of these Ooh. questions. I know a lot can change between now and next season, but how much of DJ's success do you think came from him having fresher legs than everyone else towards the end of the season, like Hill and Anderson last year? What are your end of season feelings on DJ if Chris Johnson leaves or I'm sorry, yeah, or Rawls if Lynch leaves? If if both of them are set up as the one, I have to go with David Johnson because of the offense. I believe the Arizona Cardinals will be putting more points on the board. Also, if you look pre-draft, right, at just talent, if both guys have the opportunity, David Johnson was a physical freak and Thomas Rawls went undrafted. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Thomas Rawls averaged 5.6 a carry. That is correct. Thomas Rawls is the guy I would choose in standard leagues if all things were equal, and I would probably to choose DJ in uh, half point and full point. I like as that of take. today. As of today, I, I like that take. Uh, it will be very hard for me to pass David Johnson, though. Yep. Matt in Athens, Ohio. Hey guys, love the show. I thought I'd share something that I tried this year, and I think it worked out pretty well for me. So this is our reaction to that. Okay. He went for upper-tier tight ends in all three of his leagues and made it to the championship in all three leagues. He previously valued them much lower with very little success. Is there something to be said for having a guy like Greg Olson, Rule 86, and Barnage? I wanted to know what your thoughts were on having a big-time tight end. It's... What uh, I have to say this, you named three guys right. and two of them weren't big time tight ends. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's so valuable to have a big name tight end, <laughs> but you just don't know that you're going to get them when you, when you draft them, you, you know, you, you draft high and you get Travis Kelsey because you think he's going to finish there and he doesn't. So it, that's where Greg Olson. Sure. I mean, he's very consistent. Uh, Gronk, he costs probably too much, but yeah. Uh, These guys you didn't have to pay. You said you went for upper tier tight ends, but those two you didn't have to pay for. So I don't know if that means you drafted Greg Olson in all three leagues. And you're just wanting us to consider these guys going into next year. In that case, let's just say, is it worth the cost if you know you can get it? I love if I can get someone that I know is going to be a, or I'm very sure is going to be a separator at that position. I love grabbing them in the fourth or fifth round. I also think in smaller leagues, it's even more important. Yeah. Yeah. In, in smaller leagues, like a, a 10 team or so, you got to have an advantage there. Yeah, I agree with you. So listen, if you have a question for the show, it's very easy. Go to thefantasyfootballers.com. Click the submit a question button. Send it into the show. We try to answer those on almost every episode. A lot of times during the off season, we do some bonus episodes, mailbag episodes. And so we want to answer those. It's never too early. It's February 1st, guys. It's free, that means free practically preseason. No, free agency's in a month. It's true. And this news, I mean... And then it'll be the draft. Look, we've already got this Calvin Johnson you know, story that's coming out of, uh, out of his camp that you know, changes the equation for guys like Golden Tate, for Matt Stafford, somebody who I believe on this show we said we really like Matt Stafford next year unless <laughs> Calvin Johnson's Man, gone. Golden Tate dynasty owners, when they, heard, when they heard that news, what were they doing? <laughs> Well, it's just it's Probably interesting. Weeping. 
I, you know who else is weeping, honestly, is if you're a Detroit Lions fan, you're not. it's not a good thing to lose Calvin Johnson. No. no. You know, he's not old, right? He's 30. Okay, he's a 30-year-old wide receiver. Barry Sanders. Oh, well, and he's that's doing the, it again. That's the tragedy there is that you have the same franchise dealing with uh, <laughs> that type of a problem. So, Why do they want to retire so quick? Detroit every year in Detroit's like two and <laughs> yeah in other in other franchises I think I'm yeah. sorry I'm sorry Detroit so anyways we'll be back on Thursday we'll be talking the other positions the rookies breaking them down projecting them forward we'll have a lot of other good stuff uh, but Rookie not not the Pro Bowl back. goodbye thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers podcast join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter 